the side of Beverly Hillbillies we didn't know. Back in the 1960s, the Beverly Hillbillies swept West Hollywood and our hearts. Who wouldn't be entertained by the antics of a rustic family forced into the glitz and glamour of Beverly Hills? Critics, for example. But viewers have adored the Clampets for years, which is why the sitcom is one of the most watched television shows of all time. But it's not all flowers and possums. There are plenty of juicy backstage secrets. Here are some of our favorites. Critics hated the show. It may have been one of the top 20 most watched TV series of all times with several Emmy nods, but that didn't mean reviewers had to appreciate it. Actually, they detested it. The New York Times called the show strained and unfunny, while Variety called it painful to sit through. According to one especially scathing review, if television is America's vast wasteland, the hillbillies must be Death Valley. A Leading Man Straight Out of Oz Prior to his portrayal as the primary character, Jed Clampett, Buddy Abson was a renowned dancer and vaudeville performer who shared the stage with cinema legends such as Judy Garland and Shirley Temple. His gangly motions landed him the role of the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz, but he had to quit owing to an allergic reaction to the aluminum metallic makeup. He blamed his lung issues on that damned movie later in life. Nancy Culp went into politics. Remember Jane Hathaway, Mr. Drysdale's secretary, the cunning banker? Nancy Culp, who subsequently chose to try her hand at politics and run for the United States House of Representatives from Pennsylvania, played her. Buddy Ebsen was having none of it. Buddy Ebsen, her co-star, was fiercely opposed to her, shedding light on their precarious relationship. She lost the election when he ran a blistering radio campaign against her. He was never forgiven by her. A Mansion on the Cheap Side According to rumors, Paul Henning, the show's creator, paid only $500 to film at the Bel Air home where the Beverly Hillbillies relocated after finding gold. The price of the property was reduced by $50 million a few years ago since no bidder had been found. The estate, once known as Chartwell, was valued at around $195 million, or slightly more than half of its original asking price. The Mansion's Not-So-Secret Location Arnold Kirkaby, the mansion's owner, tragically died in an aircraft crash just a few months before the episode aired. His wife continued to reside in the home and agreed to the show filming there on the condition that the address of the mansion not be divulged. However, fans learned the address and gathered in hopes of catching a glimpse of the cast members. The theme song was just too catchy. The theme music for the program was The Ballad of Jed Clampett, which was originally performed by Jerry Scroggins and featured the bluegrass combo Flat and Scruggs. The song was so popular that it charted at number 44 on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1962. Jethro's actor said the role ruined him. Maximilian Adalbert Max Bear Jr. rose to prominence as the dim-witted Jethro Bodine. However, he feels that celebrity was a double-edged sword and that by playing the character, he fell into the dreadful pit of typecasting, which ended his acting career. He performed a few minor roles throughout the years, but he was mostly known for his writing, producing, and directing. Even John Wayne got in on the fun. In the fifth season, John Wayne made a brief appearance. Throughout the episode, The Indians Are Coming, Granny expresses her desire for John Wayne to appear and assist in the struggle against the Injuns. To Granny's delight, John Wayne does indeed appear. Wayne apparently accepted a bottle of bourbon as payment for his presence on the show. Of course, the producers were delighted to accept this offer. Sharon Tate, the bank teller. Sharon Tate is most known as one of the victims of the Manson family murders, as well as the pregnant wife of filmmaker Roman Polanski at the time, although she had a recurrent role on Beverly Hillbillies before that. Tate appears 15 times as Janet Trigo, a bank teller. Mattel stole Ellie May's image. Ellie May, Jed Clampett's critter-loving daughter, wasn't the princess type, but that didn't stop Mattel from making her a Barbie doll. 
Douglas chose to sue Mattel in 2011 for using her picture without her permission, and the case was finally resolved out of court. Jethro is the only one still alive. Due to the untimely death of Donna Douglas, Max Baird Jr., nicknamed Jethro, became the sole living actor from the core cast in January 2015. The actor hoped to open a chain of Beverly Hillbillies-themed hotels, restaurants, and casinos in Nevada. Make your own fried possum. While the idea of fried possum might not sound especially appealing, Granny's Cuisine inspired several cookery books and recipes, including Granny's Beverly Hillbillies Cookbook, which contains images and character bios in addition to recipes. Buddy Ebsen went on to play a detective. Buddy Ebsen later starred as Barnaby Jones in a CBS detective series about a father and daughter-in-law who manage a private detective company in Los Angeles. Ebsen played Barnaby Jones in the 1993 film adaptation of The Beverly Hillbillies. Who cares what the critics say? While critics weren't blown away, the numbers speak for themselves. Beverly Hillbillies reached the top of the TV ratings just three weeks after its initial broadcast, the quickest ascension to the top in television history, and then managed to stay there for an unprecedented two years. Donna Douglas Before Fame Donna was a high school athlete who participated in basketball and softball and was crowned Miss New Orleans and Miss Baton Rouge in beauty pageants. We can see why. Years later, after becoming famous for her portrayal as Ellie Mae Clampett, Douglas was asked onto the Jerry Springer show, and when told that she was the show's sex symbol, she wasn't sure how to respond. She made a joke, but she was clearly embarrassed. All Good Things Must End Despite its success, The Beverly Hillbillies was canceled in 1971 by CBS executive Fred Silverman who stated that there were too many rural-type series on the network at the time and that the network was afraid of getting typecast for that niche market. The Jalopy The dusty, broken-down 1921 Oldsmobile Model 46 Roadster was an iconic member of the cast, and while not technically an actor, it played an important role in the series. In 1976, the automobile was given to a museum as part of its bicentennial festivities. The automobile was even moved to England for a few episodes. All the way to the bank. Who needs labor when you can strike oil? The Clampett's family fortune increased from $25 million to $100 million by the end of the series run. That's not a light matter. From Hillbilly to Author Long after he departed from show business, Buddy Ebsen authored a novel called Kelly's Quest. It's a series of poems that progressively show the journey of a little girl through joy and sadness, learning life's most essential lessons along the way. Ebsen self-published it, and the novel peaked at number three on the Los Angeles Times paperback bestseller list in 2001. Follow-up movie. The Beverly Hillbillies film was released in 1993. Fans rejected the new performers in well-established roles, and the film bombed. It was chastised for failing to recreate any of the original series' charm. According to one critic, it is one of the worst films of this year, or any year. Here's how the idea was born. Paul Henning had the concept for the program while traveling across the South with his mother-in-law seeing Civil War battlefields in 1959. The idea was to take someone from the rural South and place them in the heart of a modern, more sophisticated town. Which episode was the best? The Season 3 Beverly Hillbillies episode, Had a Hopper's Hollywood, was the series' highest-ranked episode, ranking 62 on TV Guide's 100 Greatest Episodes of All Time list in 1997. Not bad for a bunch of jerks! Max Bear Jr. sued CBS for the rights to his character's name. Max Bear Jr., better known as Jethro Bodine, filed five complaints against CBS for using his name in a chain of restaurants called Jethro's Barbecue. CBS was aware of the violation but failed to tell Bear. In the end, they reached an out-of-court settlement for an undisclosed sum.